Well, have you ever seen images of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch? It's a giant whirlpool of garbage, mainly plastics, that covers hundreds of thousands of square kilometers in the North Pacific. The floating refuse is a vivid reminder of one of the world's pressing environmental problems, plastic disposal. Sean Frankson has an idea that could help and reduce poverty at the same time. Sean is a graduate of Royal Road's Entrepreneurial Management Program, together with partner David Katz, he has co-founded the Plastic Bank. Good morning, Sean. Oh, good morning. Where did this idea come from? Well, David Katz and I have been running a very successful business for the last couple of years, and we're fortunate to say it's now kind of on autopilot. And we've been really looking to start another business that wouldn't just make money, but would really impact the world. And David is a world traveler, which also meant he's seen a lot of things that not everyone in North America has seen. He's been to beaches that actually has more plastic than sand. And we really started looking into this issue. And we found out that over 300 million tons of plastic is produced each year, and 7 million of that ends up in the ocean. I mean, and plastic doesn't degrade. It breaks into small little pieces that get eaten by the marine life. And really, it goes into our own food chain. And then when you combine this with the fact that over 3.5 billion people survive on less than 250 a day, it's eye-opening. So we really started to look for a solution that could potentially tackle both issues at the same time. And the overall thing we came up with is that if we reveal value in waste plastic, it turns into a currency and it becomes too valuable to throw away and too valuable to let sit on a beach. And this is the core purpose of what we do. And this is really the idea that led to the plastic bank. So explain to me how this works. How does the plastic bank operate? So we've created an exchange system in which anyone can collect enough plastic waste to get the items that they need to ascend from poverty. We do this by setting up plastic collection and exchange facilities. And this is done in areas with an abundance of plastic waste and an abundance of poverty. We're fortunate to have some great partners in doing this. One of our partners, Mike Biddle, he's pretty much the first person in the world who can actually take mixed plastic, sort it, recycle it, and repurpose it into other goods. So you can think of it like a return depot, but there's no money exchanged, and all forms of plastic are accepted. So we exchange those mixed plastics for credits that go towards the things that the members need. It's really a system where mixed plastic is the currency. Why not use money? Why, why use a credit system? So often cash-based systems go very corrupt very quickly, and it puts a lot of people in danger, and it's really tough because it becomes subjective to what you can accept. And often the things that work in North America don't always transfer into developing nations and into countries with a very different system and very different recycling systems. So credits can safely accumulate, but also more importantly, one of our goal is to universally realize that plastic is a commodity and resources and commodities really are traded as a currency and they are the currency. So it's a safe system that can be replicated anywhere in the world. I understand phase two of this project beyond just using plastic as credit involves the use of 3D printers. Can you explain that for me? For sure, 3D printing is going to be such a game changer in just the way the world works. I think we're about five years away from a 3D printer being in every household just the way a computer is, just the way a desktop printer is. And the amazing things with 3D printing is you don't need to do long-run manufacturing. You can have a single need and print it. You can have someone crowdsource a creative solution to make something filter water better. You can have a creative solution to printing parts to fixing things, to having hygiene and plumbing systems. And really, if it works in one place in the world, that same file can be printed everywhere in the world. And this is where 3D printing unleashes the creativity of people. And especially where when we look at helping someone ascend from poverty, where really their whole purpose is to survive. When you can get them out of that stage, they can really become contributing. They can become entrepreneurial. And what you find is that so many people... They're smart, creative, talented, and when we unleash the collective creativity, so many solutions that can be 3D printed will be revealed, 
And this will become a community of people collectively raising a standard of living. I wonder, though, if 3D printing would add to the proliferation of plastic. I mean, uh, we, we talked a lot, for example, in the 1990s about a paperless society with, with, with the rise of the PC computer and so on. And what we ended up getting was, was actually more paper use. I wonder if 3D printers could lead to more problems than they solve when it comes to plastic. I think it's definitely a possibility because, and this again it becomes the entire concept of creating value in waste plastic so plastic doesn't get wasted. With 3D printing, the world's demand for plastic will great, increasingly get bigger. And again, where I don't recommend everything in the world get printed in plastic and we won't only give away goods made of plastic. But what gets really interesting, where 3D printing will increase the world's demand for plastic, which also at the same time we hopefully will increase the world's demand for recycled plastic instead of new plastic. But that means more goods, as you said, will be made of plastic than before. But that also means if there are facilities that anyone can bring in a 3D printed good of plastic, it can be exchanged as currency based on the weight. And that'll actually create that system where a 3D printed good automatically is recyclable because it was made of a printable material. So this is really how, in our eyes, we can close that problem before it starts. Your first location is slated for Peru. Why did you choose Peru in particular for this credit system? Yeah, there's a couple of factors. We really were eyeing Latin America as a starting point. We came to learn that 2% of waste gets recycled in Peru. Most of it ends up in the rivers and the waterways, which ends up on the beach and back in the ocean, and a lot of it's on the land. But also we came to realize that in Peru, the poverty situation is getting a little bit worse because people are coming from the mountains and going into the major cities. So we were actually approached by a partner in Peru who loved the idea, really loved the cause, and is really motivated to see to make it work. So Peru became a natural starting point for us. Well, Sean, it's good to talk to you about this. Thanks very much for taking some time. Oh, not a problem. And I would quickly like to say that we are funding this project on a crowdsourcing platform called Indiegogo. So anyone can go to plasticbank.org, check out the project, and really be a part of our solution. Crowdfunding lets anybody contribute to the cause and really be a part of helping to reduce plastic waste and reducing poverty around the world. Sean Frankson is the co-founder of the Plastic Bank. To find out more about the project, check out plasticbank.org.